let's, uh, let's dig into the Word together. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to the book of Titus chapter 3. And uh, today we are concluding our series uh, where we have walked through the book of Titus, Titus being a letter from the Apostle Paul to Titus um, regarding uh, healthy churches, regarding what it means to be a mature believer. And uh, there's been some really challenging scriptures, some really encouraging scriptures. And uh, our, our tagline for this series has been gospel truth leads to godly living. It's the theme we see throughout all three chapters is that when we receive God's grace that has been extended to us, it is what comes first. We don't earn it. God extends his grace towards us. But when we experience the life life-changing power of the gospel, the grace of God, that it changes the way that we live, that we do not stay the same. We grow in godliness. We grow in holiness. We grow in maturity. And so uh, we just want to make it clear that as a church, it is our desire to focus on the gospel, to preach the gospel. But beyond that, uh, with the days that we have left after receiving the gospel, that we encourage each other, we challenge each other to grow in godliness, to grow in holiness. Uh, because there is a difference that can be made in this world the more that we become more like Christ, the more difference can be made in the people around us and in the generation after us. So we're not looking to be judgmental, to be legalistic, uh, to be self-righteous, but to say, God, your gospel is so powerful and there is purpose in my remaining days uh, that I want to grow in godliness and we want to be around a community that is growing in godliness. Let's uh, read today. We're going to go verse 8 through the end of the letter, which is verse 15. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. If not, we have it on the screen for you. It says this, this is a trustworthy saying. I'll pause real quick to say it's referring to what we just talked about last week, laying out the gospel in such a beautiful way that says we were saved by his kindness and his mercy, not by the good things that we have done and the promise of eternal life that we hold. So it just preaches the gospel and says that it's a trustworthy saying. And I want you to insist on teaching these things so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are good and beneficial for everyone. Do not get involved in foolish discussions about spiritual pedigrees or in quarrels and fights about obedience to Jewish laws. These things are useless and a waste of time. If you are an underliner or a highlighter of your Bible, would you just note those words, a waste of time? Verse 10, if people are causing divisions among you, give a first and a second warning. After that, have nothing more to do with them. For people like that have turned away from the truth and their own sins condemn them. I am planning to send either Artemis or Tychicus to you. As soon as one of them arrives, do your best to meet me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to stay there for the winter. Do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos with their trip. See that they are given everything that they need. Our people must learn to do good by meeting the urgent needs of others. Then they will not be unproductive. You can highlight that word as well. Some of your translations say unfruitful. Then they will not be unproductive or unfruitful. Everybody here sends greetings. Please give my greetings to the believers, all who love us. May God's grace be with you all. I love that this letter starts and it ends with grace. Lots to say in, the, in between, but it is grace that sustains. It is grace that initiates. It's grace that produces godly living inside of us. And uh, we're going to focus on these verses here today. Would you bow your heads? Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you. It is alive and it is active. And uh, it's going to do something deep within our hearts today. That uh, today we're not just going to be hearers of your word, uh, but we're going to put it into practice. That it's going to take root. We love you. Our hearts are open and receptive. It's your name we're gathered. It's your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Um, uh, this is a, a broad stroke, but I think it's safe to say that we all uh, don't like it when we waste time. Like waste of time is a frustration. Uh, maybe if I say, when have you recently had your time wasted? You can think of all types of different examples of it. Uh, sometimes a waste of time is our, is, our, is our own fault. We forgot something or we lack self-discipline or, or it sometimes it's our fault. Sometimes it's somebody else's. Like they didn't put the, the lunch date on their calendar or they showed up late or the boss didn't use the project that you put the time and the effort into. Uh, there's different times and reasons why our time gets wasted. Anybody uh, like me and like, you don't like wasting time, but you find yourself pretty good at it. It's just so frustrating. Like it just, ah, where did it go? Uh, we, we, uh, we don't like wasting time, but it happens. Uh, it's not uncommon uh, for my wife, Danny, to uh, text me near the end of a work day and say, hey, will you run by the grocery store and pick up this ingredient uh, on your way home? Uh, which is 
for some of us is terrifying, but it's always like, yes, of course I will. Uh, and, and my wife, not only for dinner, but she, she and, uh, and Whitney run a cake business. And so always baking cakes and there's all kinds of, of cake ingredients that, that need to be bought at different times. And uh, I remember this one time Danny asked me, um, would you swing by the store on your way home and buy some almond extract? I was like, of course I will do this. Uh, it takes me a while, but I find the extract section of the grocery store, which I'm not real familiar with, but there's extracts, all these little bottles of extracts. And uh, I know that I need to get almond extract. She told me like what the label looks like, what brand I'm supposed to get. And so uh, I'm hunting and I find the almond extract. I buy this little bottle at priced way too much and take the almond extract home, uh, put it on the counter. She says, thank you. I was like, you're welcome. I did it. And she says, uh, actually I asked you for almond extract. I was like, I, I, it's right there. Like I, I've, I tried to follow all the checklist of the brand, everything. And as she turns the bottle around and it clearly says vanilla extract on it. <laughs> it wasn't a lack of effort, a lack of desire. I completely wasted time because I got the wrong thing. Uh, she texts me another time like, hey, can you get six inch white cake pop sticks? Uh, I was like, yes, I can do this. Uh, I can get uh, six inch white cake pop sticks, um, which you tell me where six inch white cake pop sticks are at your local grocery store. Uh, but I find them. I find the six inch white cake pop sticks. I double check, I triple check, I quadruple check. They are white and they are six inches and they had like a, a whole rack of them. And so I decide, you know what? I'm not just gonna get the numbers that she asked me to get. I'm gonna save time in the future and we're buying this whole rack. Like we will make more cake pops in the future. We're buying all of them. It will save us time. They'll be in the closet. No worries. Uh, I'm so excited that uh, I bought extra. I'm saving us time in the future. I have a bag full of white six inch cake pop sticks, put them on the counter. You guys know something's about to go wrong, don't you? <laughs> Throw them on the counter. She opens them up and uh, she looks at me and says, they're the wrong ones. I was like, they are not. <laughs> they are white and they are six inches. I know this for a fact. She goes, but they're too thick. <laughs> I think they could still eat a cake pop off of a thicker stick, but that's not for me to tell. Uh, and who knew that some butter is salted and some is unsalted? It just you, you learn that you have wasted time, not because you didn't try, you didn't put forth the time and the effort, but sometimes we are active, but in all the wrong ways. It doesn't mean like we meant to. We, we were doing the work. We we're putting forth attention. But in the end, it was actually just a waste of time. What we see here is that uh, Paul in, uh, realizes the potential that it is possible for the church, it is possible for believers to be active, but not productive. To be active, to exist, to engage, to be living somewhat of our Christian faith, but what we're doing, it's not actually producing fruit. And Paul wraps up this letter to Titus about gospel truth leading to godly living, and he wraps it up with an urgent call to be fruitful. Make sure that our people, that our churches, that believers are not unproductive. They're not unfruitful. Make sure that we are not a gathering of people that is simply wasting their time. Meaning, if this is Paul, and this is his urgent final words, his conclusion in this letter, it means that Paul recognizes that this is a problem. It's a problem for believers. It's a problem for church communities to exist and be active, but in all the wrong things to feel good that we, we are doing something, we're gathering, we do this every week, we've got our routines, but actually the, the, the product, the end result is it's not fruitful. It's not making the difference that the church was intended to make. Let's look at this a little closer, verse by verse. Verse eight says, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to insist on teaching these things. I insist that you focus on the gospel. And then it says, so that. Like there is a result of focusing on the gospel so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are good and they're beneficial to everyone. He says, stress the gospel. Make the gospel the focus. Never, never turn away from your central point being the goodness, the grace of our God. Keep the gospel your focus. But this focus will result in what? It says so that the, the people who have received the gospel, those who trust in God, they're gonna spend the rest of their days devoted to doing good. Meaning that the gospel is not just something to be believed and to be received. The gospel is something to be lived. 
that it impacts the way that we live. Again, the gospel truth leads to godly living. And when this happens, it says that uh, it should be beneficial to everyone, meaning that other people's lives should benefit from the gospel touching yours. This is fruitfulness. That if the gospel has touched us, of course, there's so much that we have talked about and we'll keep talking about of what it does for us, God's love for us and salvation and hope and purpose. But when the gospel touches us, it should be beneficial to others. Verse nine goes on to say, do not get involved in foolish discussions about spiritual pedigrees or in quarrels and fights about obedience to Jewish laws. These things are useless and a waste of time. If people are causing divisions among you, give a first and second warning. After that, have nothing more to do with them. For people like that have turned away from the truth and their sins, their own sins condemn them. So he says this, focus on the gospel, preach the gospel, like that, make sure that this is central to what you're doing. And the second thing he wants us to do is make sure that we avoid time-wasting quarrels. Uh, just don't get involved, don't get sidetracked, don't get sucked into these quarrels that can waste your time. It says, don't get sidetracked by divisive issues, verse nine, or divisive people, verse 10. There are issues that can be divisive and there are people that can be divisive. He says, don't get sidetracked, don't waste your time making this your platform, your purpose, what you spend your time and energy on. Now, this has got to be held in context with all that Paul has said in this letter. And Paul, he is not, he doesn't shy away from conviction. He doesn't shy away uh, from talking about divisive issues or, or uh, standing up to those in opposition. In fact, as we've already studied together in this series, uh, he says, know what you believe and stand up for it. Oppose. He even says sometimes silence those who are teaching differently. Like, he's not saying just let anything go. He says like, know what you believe, stand up for it. Uh, he says, uh, but we don't, it, it, we don't ignore this false teaching. We don't ignore division. We deal with it. And we give it some time, we give it some attention. In fact, in this, this verse here, he says, have the first conversation, follow up, have a second conversation, like give it time, go deep, deal with it. But if you recognize after a couple of conversations about a divisive issue or with divisive people, if you recognize this is actually just sucking my time, it's sucking my, my life, my energy, like this is not, we don't see progress happening here. There's not a responsiveness, there's not a growing in godliness. This is just something that we we're gonna argue about. He says, after you devote time, and attention and energy and you dig deep, if it's not moving forward, he says, in, in the words of Jesus, shake the dust and move on and go be what God has called you to be. Go do what God has called you to do. Go make a difference in the world. Don't get sidetracked from the preaching of the gospel and building the church. He's like, deal with it, but make sure you recognize your primary purpose is to preach the gospel and to build the church. That is your primary reason, not just arguing and, and spending your time in areas that are not productive, are not, uh, they, they seem to be a waste of time. Um, meaning that we do not need to condemn anyone as it finishes off in verse 11, but we're to have convictions, know what they are, hold tight to them, but we're not gonna waste our time arguing and defending them at the cost of sharing the gospel and building the church. We deal with them, but as soon as it starts hindering the preaching of the gospel and the building of the church, we cut it off and we go back to what we are intended to make our priority. Verse 12 says, um, I'm planning to send either Artemis or Tychicus to you. As soon as one of them arrives, do your best to meet me at Nicopolis, for I've decided to stay there for the winter. Do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos with their trip. See that they are given everything that they need. Now on the surface, uh, removed from this specific situation, these verses can just seem like uh, unimportant details. I actually believe that verses 12 and 13 may have been the most difficult verses for Titus to read in a letter from Paul. Uh, starting with verse 13, it says, hey, make sure that Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos, that you help them with their trip. Make sure that they have everything that they need for their trip. Now, we gotta remember, these are real people, real relationships, real places. And if you, if you read scripture, um, in the New Testament, many of the believers pitted Apollos and Paul against each other as rivals. You can read in 1 Corinthians chapter three, where Paul's saying like, hey, let's chill with this, I follow Paul and I follow Apollos and having this division. Let's recognize that God is doing a work. He uses different people to preach the gospel in different ways, in different cultures, but it is still the gospel. So let's not divide ourselves. Let's recognize that God is doing a work and he can use different people with different communication styles, different church building styles. It is still God involved. And so even though they're pitted as rivals 
And, and Titus, they're like the other Paul and Titus. Paul tells them, hey, make sure that they're well-funded. Make sure that we're not just keeping everything for ourselves and we're just building our own platform, but that we are kingdom-minded, that we are team players, that we're investing in others. It's amazing that Paul says this to Titus. You want to keep building a healthy church? Make sure that it's not just about our anchor church kingdom. Make sure that you recognize the way that God is moving in your community with other personalities, the different styles, and just, just cheer them on. Now, you do what I designed you to do, but cheer on and invest in and make sure that the church has what it needs to bring the gospel to your community. It's amazing. And then verse 12. He's just finished this letter to Titus of all the work he wants Titus to do to establish this healthy church. And he says that also I want you to know that uh, I'm planning to send either Artemis or Tychicus to you. When they show up, I want you to depart from the work that you've just invested your life into and come join me and let somebody else run with the churches that you've just built. This has got to be really hard for Titus. Wait, hold on. You just gave three chapters of incredibly difficult work you've asked me to do of establishing healthy churches with healthy doctrine, authority, leadership structures, raising up other leaders. Like you want me to, to get this thing going, finally have some health and momentum, and then turn it over to somebody else and leave it behind. But what is amazing about this is from the inception of the church, there was a grander vision than how many people can gather right now and hear Titus preach. The grander long-term vision was how do we build something so healthy it will outlast the founders. This was the vision of the church. That how do we make sure that it's not just an attraction to a couple gift sets, a couple skills, how well someone can speak or the band that's playing. How do we make sure that it is a healthy structure that can outlast the first generation anchor people? I mean, we are, we're about to hit our second year anniversary. So we're all founders at this point. Like nobody's been here all that long. How do we make sure that a church is built with, from the inception, that it's not just gonna be built around a couple people, but it's gonna be a healthy body with good doctrine, with healthy authority and accountability structures, and to make sure that leaders are being raised up so that this can outlast a, a, a couple of people that maybe help start it, get, get the ball rolling. This was the vision from the beginning. I wanna tell you, this, this scripture, as uh, simple as it can sound, is really vital and has been vital to the beginning season here at Anchor Church. In fact, one of our core values is, uh, is future. From the very inception that we've decided, like, you know what's going on here is we are empowering the church of today to build the church of tomorrow. Another tagline you'll often hear from us is we're building a church that outlasts us. Too often we're looking for a church to satisfy us, what we want, what we, what we like, what, what would feed us best. But we've got this desire because it's the, the template that we see in scripture is that from inception, how do we create something healthy? that a future generation of leaders at Anchor Church that we don't even know who they are yet, uh, it's healthy for them to take it over. What's it look like to be invested in a community that not just for us, but for something that outlasts us? And just as Titus put in the difficult hard work, the initial labor, so that future generations could be impacted by the church, we here at this stage of Anchor Church have the same opportunity that we have the privilege of participating in the hard work that makes it easier for others in the future to experience the life-changing power of the presence of God. It's, a, it's this season. I, I, I'm convinced that years from now, others will benefit from the sacrifice of today. And in fact, it's in these early years that uh, the legends are made. We're gonna be those people that are like uh, grandparents who had to walk uphill both ways in the snow. It's gonna be like, well, when we started Anchor Church, we had to lay out tarps at 7 a.m. And you wouldn't believe how uncomfortable the black chairs were that had zero padding. And the guy just kept talking and talking and talking. Uh, we sat in these chairs. Like, this is, this is gonna be the time. Like, this is not the most comfortable season of a church. And it's amazing that God is bringing you to be a part of this church at this time. Because it's not the most Comfortable. We don't have all of the ministry opportunities. We don't have a building throughout the week. There's a lot that we don't have. And so what's amazing is that God is bringing together a community of people that while he's doing a work in us, he's also allowing us to participate in the hard work that is going to make it more comfortable, convenient, easier access to the people of Missoula in the days ahead. That we do the hard work today so that future generations and future leaders are gonna be raised up because of today's sacrifice. Verse 14, 
It says, our people must learn to do good by meeting the urgent needs of others. Then they will not be unproductive or unfruitful. This is um, the sixth time that explicitly good works is brought up in these three chapters. It really is the entirety of this book of what the gospel truth leads to in godly living. But for the sixth time, it's saying fruitfulness. It's tied to us living out godliness, to to living differently, to producing a life of good works. And again, the context is important. It is gospel truth first. That we're not just trying to go out there and just be humanitarians. It is the gospel changing us to love people the way that Jesus loves them, to see the city the way that Jesus sees them, to to make our decisions and our financial priorities the way that he would. It's, It's the gospel changing us first, but it always produces a productive, fruitful, life in impacting other people. Paul, as he concludes this letter, he makes it so clear that he desires to see a healthy church and an influential church. And I just want to say clearly that it is our desire at Anchor Church to be a healthy church and an influential church. I want to be clear that influential doesn't mean how many people show up on a Sunday or how big our buildings are. What, what, what influential means is that the individuals that are following Jesus together in this community are making a difference in the lives of the people around them and the generation after us. It's not about, hey, let's get to this size. It's like, hey, let's be a healthy people, a healthy body that uh, is making a difference. That we're not wasting our time, but there is fruitfulness. There is, uh, there is something that happens in, in the lives of the people around us because of what the gospel has done inside of us. Paul recognizes, again, that it is possible to exist in a community and not be fruitful. And his final urgent plea is, we got to insist that our people in our communities and for ourselves, that we let the gospel translate into the way that we live. We're going to grow in godliness. We're going to grow in holiness. There is going to be impact and influence because he says, if you just exist and you're not making a difference, it is just a waste of time. And I just want to say personally, and I believe this is the heart of many people in the room, is we desire to be a part of a church community that is unwilling to simply exist. Our goal is not to just have a place where we gather on Sunday mornings until our lives are up. We don't want to just simply exist. That We believe that God birthed Anchor Church through this community for a purpose, for an impact. It wasn't just for us to have a place to go. It was because of the people around us and the generation after us. I want to conclude our time in this series and uh, our time here together today by looking at Psalms chapter 90. Um, I referenced this verse uh, several weeks ago when we talked about uh, the older and the younger. If you were here, that was such a special Sunday. It was one of my favorite times we've had together as a church this last year, uh, talking about the older and the younger. And uh, we had this dividing line of who's older, who's younger, based on this verse that we're going to look at in Psalm 90. It says that we're given 70 years. We made 35 the cutoff line. If you're above 35, you're older. If you're under, you're younger. And that made more of you upset than I expected. (laughs) It's like but we prayed for each other. Wasn't it awesome? Uh, And so this verse, I just want to reference it again as we wrap up our time together. It says this, Psalms 90, verse 10. 70 years are given to us. Some even live to 80. But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear and we fly away. Verse 12, teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. Teach us to realize the brevity of life. Some of your translations say, help us to recall that our days are numbered so that we may grow in wisdom. Now, not to be a downer, not to be morbid, but I think it's important for us to pause and reflect on the reality of the brevity of life. And in fact, the psalmist, this is his prayer that God's people would recognize, that we would realize how short our lives are, that it's limited, I think that um, recognizing that time is running out is always a motivating factor. It kind of gets our focus. What is most essential? What is most important? We only have this much time left. How do we make sure the most important details get covered? We uh, have different lifespans. This says in general we get 70 years. Some get to experience many more years beyond 70. Some unfortunately never get the privilege of living a life that long. 
their life taken too short. But in general, we've got a lifespan of about 70 years. It says even the best of those years, they're unfulfilling. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but this earth, this life, even if we've had incredible experiences, we're still left unfulfilled. There's always something more that we want. We can label it whatever we want, our lack of uh, just being satisfied or greed. Or, or what. The reality is, is that whenever we experience unfulfillment, it should be a reminder that fulfillment will only come in the presence of God. We shouldn't be surprised when even the best of days we feel like something's lacking, something's missing. I want to tell you that fulfillment can't be found on this earth, can't be found in the pleasures that we get to experience, that whatever, even our best of days, is going to leave us lacking. Now I hope that you have a lot of years left. I hope they are as fulfilling as they can be. I hope they're rewarding. And I know we have different ages represented in this room. And regardless of our ages, None of us know when our time is up. But life has been given to us. And there is an end to this temporary physical life. And the clock's ticking for all of us. And the psalmist is saying, teach us to realize that. To consider the brevity of life. Because when we recognize it's short, it's going to grant us wisdom. We're going to be more focused on how do we make sure that this short time that we have is not wasted. Helps us remember that every day matters. Because regardless of age, we don't know how many days we have left. And we don't get to dictate and decide how many days are left, but we do get to decide if the day that we are given is productive, if it's fruitful, or if it's a waste of time. I'm going to ask the band to join me. Church, the beautiful truth that we've been given is that we have one life and it's beautiful and it's precious and it's full of ups and downs, agony, pain, joys. We've given one life. But we only get one. And I think oftentimes the challenge that we face is that there's a desire in us as humans to find comfort, to find what just makes us happy, comfortable. But I think the challenge that we have is so often, even most often, I feel like purpose and impact don't coincide with what's most comfortable. The purpose and impact often means discomfort, sacrifice, doing things that maybe aren't ideal for, for advancing me. And I just want to remind as we conclude this series that comfort and so much more, the fulfillment that we're longing for, joy and peace, it's coming. And it's coming eternally. Not a fleeting fulfillment, not a fleeting joy, but the day is coming where the followers of Jesus will experience eternity in his presence, restored to perfection, where there will be no more tears, there will be no more pain, there will be no more loss and tragedy, there will be no more political turmoil and frustration. Like we will live in eternity in the fulfillment that is the presence of God. It's coming. And not only is it coming, but when it comes to us, it is for eternity, which we cannot even begin to comprehend the length of eternity. But it is coming. We will have the comfort that we long for, but we gotta be reminded that that comfort doesn't come this side of eternity. We can fight for it, we can long for it, we can make decisions that serve myself, but we will still be left unfulfilled until we're in his presence for eternity. 
But when we cross the threshold from the temporary life that we're living now to eternity in the presence of God, when we cross that threshold, it comes in exchange with the one brief opportunity that we've been given to make a difference in this world. It'll be over. We get one chance, one brief life that in the span of eternity, it's not even a speck on the radar. If we try to draw a line of how long eternity is, which is impossible, and then we try to put a dot where our life is, we couldn't even see it. It's so brief, it's a breath, and it's the only breath that we get to make a difference. So my question, my concern, and I say this to myself, why would we spend our brief time on this planet seeking out the comfort that we will get for eternity when this is our only chance we'll ever get to be influential for the people around us and the generation after us? I do not wanna exist on this planet for however many days God gives me and look back and see it was a waste of time trying to seek the comfort I could never get, but I will get to experience for eternity. And I didn't take advantage of the one shot he gave me to make a difference in this world. I want to tell you, Anchor, we desire to not just be a church full of individual believers that just exist and are looking for ways to make our lives as cushy as they can be. We will have eternity together. And I tell you, I look forward to the day where we worship our Jesus side by side for eternity. It's going to be a beautiful day. But until then, what are we doing with our one life, our one breath, our one opportunity? Paul's urgent cry is, don't waste your time. Don't be unfruitful. Don't be unproductive. Like focus on the gospel and let it change the way that you live. And then we have an eternity to just worship with no more pain, no more sorrow, just the beautiful presence of the joy that we find in the presence of our God. Church, life is short, but we have a mission. And we exist to see the lost found and the found anchored in the hope of Jesus. And I hope we have a lot of years, but no matter how many years it is, it's brief. I don't wanna waste it. If you're with me and if you're willing and able, would you just stand right now? We just have a few more minutes together. Before the band leads us in one last song, I just want to pray over us as a church as we wrap up the series. And next week, we're going to celebrate what God has done in year two. And we're going to look forward to what God has for us in year three. So as we wrap up year two together, I just want to pray. This heart that Paul has and something that's burning inside of me, that this would be true of who we are. It's not just a message that happened one time, one Sunday, but this is who we are as a people. I just want to pray over our church. If, uh, if you're willing, would you just put your hands out in front of you, even as a posture of, of receiving that God is actually extending to you uh, in this moment right now. Father, we just come before you as a church. And I just want to declare that we will be a people that does not just exist, but there is influence that you have put on this church. There's influence that you put on the individuals within this church. Father, we just declare right now that we will be fruitful. That doesn't mean numbers and buildings. That means that as individuals, the gospel will make a difference in our lives. And we're going to make a difference, an impact in the people around us. God, I just pray that there would just be a burning desire in us. As the psalmist says in Psalm 90, that we would be aware of, we would realize, we would be so aware of how brief our life is. And that realization would motivate us not to seek our own comfort, but to make a difference in this one precious life that you've given us. God, we will not be a church community that wastes our time, but we will preach the gospel. We will be recipients of the gospel and we will live the gospel. Father, I pray that in year three and in year five and in year 30, we look back and we see the fruitfulness of this community. We see the faithfulness of this community because your good news, your gospel has taken captive our hearts. 
God, I pray that when the day comes where this, this community is passed off to the next generation of leaders, we see that it is healthy and it is fruitful and it is productive. God, we, we want to do what we can to honor you in the call you've put on our lives for this one precious life. We long for the day where we are in your presence and we worship you for eternity. We look forward to that day. But between here and there, Father, we just want to commit to be fruitful. Father, we love you. We count it a privilege to be recipients of your grace and to be a part of what you're doing in this community. It's you that we worship. It's your name we pray. Amen. Would you join?